Hello, this is Lynn Fraser with the Radical Recovery Summit presented by the Kilby Center for Recovery. And I'm really happy to be here today with Scott Killaby. We've done these interviews every year. I'm really interested to hear what you have to say this year in particular. I know you've had a rough time with chronic back pain and you've been developing a lot of new, really effective ways to work with it. So why don't we start there and just however you want to jump in, let's talk about chronic pain. Yeah, it's, it's such a big topic. Just as soon as you bring it up, just like my mind goes, there's this, there's this, there's that, there's that. I, I think I should start a little bit from the beginning. I don't want to tell the entire story of the pain, but I think people should have a context for what work I'm doing with it. And I've had a, an injury in my spine since I was 20. Um, this injury really didn't affect me until about two and a half years ago, and it just started to get worse and worse and kind of came on really suddenly, frankly, and just amped up from, I think it was level two pain or level one, most of my, most of the 20 years, 30 years actually. And then it just started amping up to five, six, seven, if I were to quantify it. Um, so it was a struggle from the beginning because I'm in recovery and it's not like I'm going to just naturally go use heroin or painkillers and just numb out completely. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it was a struggle in the beginning of how to deal with this. Um, and, you know, first of all, when it got really bad, I went to the emergency room. I went to the emergency room about two or three times. I can't remember, maybe three times. Um, that was when it was just, so it's not just back pain. It's, uh, it's nerve pain emanating from like T11 and 12. So it's not just like muscular skeletal pain that people feel I have that or have had that. There's a nerve pain element that's incredibly uncomfortable. And it radiates nerve pain through my body when it amps up. So every time I went to the emergency room, it was really high-level nerve pain. And then usually it would die down. They would give me Toradol or something. And then, go ahead. I was just going to say, can you explain the difference between nerve pain? Is, is nerve pain kind of like when you have a toothache? Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's like, it's like well, the best way I describe it for me, I mean, everybody has different nerve pain. Some people have sciatica or something. Um, but I didn't have that where shooting pain. It's like a, it's kind of like an, a, a toothache, but not as acute as that. It's not like where you're, ah, it's, it's dimmed down a little bit and constant. So it's a nerve pain that's constant. If it was at that level, I've had it at that level. In fact, about a month ago, or more than a month ago, I was sitting right over in this couch and had um, an acute episode where it was like a, a nerve, like a tooth. And it was right in the middle of my spine. There was nothing that I could do. We were stuck on a mountain in a blizzard. And I just sat through it. I mean, I even have Xanax if I need it. And I just didn't take it even then. And just sat with it. It was incredibly painful. It's like a live wire in the middle of your back. Like a wire that's just shooting energy out, radiating energy out throughout your whole body. Couldn't move. There have been times, Lynn, when I literally cannot move, cannot talk, cannot reach for anything. It's just such intense pain. I remember standing right here in this RV and calling for my partner because I couldn't, right. I couldn't do anything. And I was just yelling for help. Those are the worst times. Mainly it's just been a chronic pain, um, with steady chronic pain. So I can tell the story that I, you know, when I had surgery on it, which was not really very successful, took painkillers for a while, for a week, I think. And a lot of times just resting with it resting with it and then when it would get really bad i would took xanax for a while there was a period where i took that there's a period where i took some ketamine for a while xanax is not a drug that was very helpful it dumbed down the pain but it didn't provide me any way of like resting with it it kind of numbed it out so i just couldn't stay on that very long and then the ketamine was good because it didn't numb it out it brought my awareness to it and it kind of slowed things down but there are side effects with that drug so that i left that alone Really, for months, it's been no medication. Gabapentin, which is innocuous kind of medicine that I would take on a bad day. I'll tell you what's helped more than anything else is just presence and inquiry. And that's where we're getting to this. Because in the beginning, I thought I was pretty, I was a little bit fixated on healing it in the beginning. And I had to work through that story because it had this sort of intensity to it. Like, and I had to just drop back into presence much more with it. So there's been a process, if I can talk about this now, I don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, but I really want to talk about this part, which is dealing with chronic pain without the use of medication, like I said, gabapentin every now and then, but sitting with it quietly then and 
of course, I've had to, it, through the years, work through any stories. And I think people with chronic pain do sometimes have to deal with deficiency stories, whatever else goes with that. I didn't have a lot of that at this point. You know, there was some of it, but it wasn't a lot of it. So my mind, I can just now go quiet and just, you know, leave the thought field in the way and then come down into the body where I'm literally right there with it, almost like right behind it as awareness, so to speak. And then it's all about reducing resistance from that place, as you know. So it's a little bit of trepidation, frankly, when with doing this, because it's like, you know, you're taught this is a physical thing and you shouldn't be, you know, messing with it. Something might happen. But I just trusted it because, frankly, I didn't have anything else to do. I mean, the medications are not not going to do it for me. So I just rested with it long hours, frankly, of resting mm-hmm. with it. Um, even like intermittently, like if I'm hanging out with my partner and we're driving in the Jeep, it's just I close my eyes and go right to it or sitting at a restaurant or anything. And what I did is I learned how, so I'm learning how to truly let it be there you know the tool that we have make it stay Mm -hmm. right we have this tool in li and ki where if you can rest with something in a way that actually welcomes it so much that that there's a small intention to let it stay instead of get rid of it as soon as i started to work with it that way um not just make let it stay or make it stay but also frankly using our tools like one of our tools is working with tethers Uh, Mm -hmm. i don't want to get too deep into this but little points at which some contraction or pain seems to tether to a a spine or a muscle or something. And it creates a little contracted tether in different places. But if I can have people visualize this, it's just like a boat that's on a harbor or tied to the dock in several places, tethered to the dock. So with the making it stay, like coming in with the intention, just can I allow this so much that I want it here? And then also working with the tethers, like tracing with my awareness around the tethers. And then they loosen up. I've literally watched this pain within my internal awareness go from what I would say is like a a coat hanger that's bent in weird ways, thriving in my very uncomfortable, moving from T11 and 12 up through the cervical area and actually into my face and nose at times. It migrated a fairly good sized structure, weird in my body. Now that thing is reduced to something like this, very small, Mm -hmm. just from resting and being with it. It just, over time, it just sort of gradually dissolves. And I guess some of the identification with it dissolves and it gets lighter and lighter. And in the last week and a half, it's actually been blissful at times, just like very positive, like blissful energy in that area, which usually tells me from our work, like when we work with contractions, that when there's a positive charge to it that it's something's moving that's what i've been you know, know from the past and so when i work with clients and they get a blissful feeling you know they like to stay there in that blissful feeling yeah. but i tell them hey that's going to be temporary too probably mm-hmm. just changing but it's nice when it's there after two and a half years of pain <laughs> yes it is yeah. yeah who knows what tomorrow brings you know i can't say oh it's going to go away we can't predict um just here with it now, reporting what has right. happened. Right. So one of the things that I, I would think would be quite common for people who have chronic pain, and especially really severe pain like that, it goes up and down in intensity most likely for people. But mm-hmm. what kind of stories, I know you work with people with pain as well. So you said you had some story, but you're kind of a little bit different in terms of you work really deeply with your mind and your thoughts you're not hooked on stories so much that's so right what kind of stories are there like why me is it ever going to end that kind of thing mm-hmm. you know i've worked with a lot of people with pain even through the years before i had this really serious pain and, and a lot of times it's things like i'm broken there's something wrong with me i'm never this is always going to be here i can't work and that a little bit of that came up for me in the most intense parts is like how am i going to work mm-hmm. you know i'm I'm working to support myself and helping with everything. So that came up. Um, but that's what comes up. People, deficiency stories, sometimes shame. There's sometimes for shame with that. People mm-hmm. don't want to let other people know how they're actually feeling. And as you know, I've put it on video and let the whole world know <laughs> at different yeah. times. Um, so the shame wasn't strong for me, but deficiency stories are there. Uh, 
why me future thinking a lot of that comes up for people um but for me yeah, yeah there wasn't a whole lot but that's what we have to work with often first is those stories of the, the mind um because those stories keep us from being able to come down and feel you know they're just we keep our attention there so i feel like we have sometimes have to work with those first right. so one of the the wonderful things that you did recently was to put together a series of videos on the Killaby Inquiries and how people can work with thoughts and energy and tethering and all of those things. So people who are um, watching the Radical Recovery Summit will get uh, a free access to that. So thank That's you. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so just maybe though, for people that might not have a chance to get into that or, or haven't yet, can you just say a few ways that people might work with those kinds of thoughts? Because that's really persistent. And it's hard to argue when you have a thought like I'm broken or this is always going to be this way. That's the evidence. How do you, how would you suggest people might work? Um, you know, it's challenging because if you've never done this, it depends on how much someone has been immersed in like meditation or inquiry to begin with. Because if I'm talking to someone here in the audience who already has that in their experience where they know how to witness thoughts, the meditation, or they've done some inquiry, that's one thing. If someone's totally new to it, I would probably have a different conversation with them or to them. But for those out there who are already in presence practices and doing some inquiry, just if you kind of follow along with me, you know, if you just feel down into the pain, wherever that is, and just ask, what is this? A simple question. What does this mean about me? And then that evokes the mind's response. So sitting quietly, you just watch. And what I tell people is, just be very deliberate. Don't, there's no reason to rush through or think through a bunch of stuff immediately. It's all going to come up. If you just rest with the first thing that comes up, what does this mean about me? I'll go from my own experience. I'm not going to be able to work. Comes up, doesn't come up now, but it did. So I just be with that, you know, and you can see that some people can see thoughts. They see them, you can put them up spelled out in your awareness where they hear them. Either way, the key here is that you're not analyzing. You're not engaging in the content. You're just resting with it, seeing it or hearing it. And what I think people need to do in order to gain confidence in this is see that when they rest with it and they're really with it for a while, very quietly, normally it'll fall away. And if it doesn't, that's fine. You could just do a little bit of tapping. Just shift your focus to the tapping. Notice that sound and sensation of the tapping. And that's what you can do when the thought feels really sticky, you know, especially if you're just starting out, that shifting focus from the thought to the tapping helps you kind of unhook from that and then allows the next thing to come through. So what I'm noticing with this work is when you, and I think we've noticed it through the years, is when you say something like, what does this mean about me? It's not just one thought. It's usually like, you can hear people saying it. They'll say like, I'm broken. I'm never going to work. Um, this is stuck. This isn't going to work. Um, um, I'm whatever series of thoughts, like a pro a set of files and program. And if you're really quiet and restful, you can, just, you can witness through each one of those one at a time, just seeing them quietly and then watching them go. And then it gets a little bit, if you watch that, even if, or you tap, it gets quieter in the mind, but be careful because there's still usually there's stuff there. You just go back down and feel and say again. What does this mean about me? And then you'll see some more stuff, other layers. If you do it several times, I say do it several times every day for a while, just mm -hmm. working on that level with one simple inquiry like that. You know, you can get pretty deep with it because the mind then after a while, when you say, what does this mean about me? You know, you get a quieter mind. There's not much coming up then. Right. But you have to work with that for a while for that to happen. So that's one thing is just asking, what does this mean about me? It's it, we call really call it a boomerang, as you know. It's like a boomerang is something that we're projecting out onto something or projecting here onto a pain, and we're putting we're getting our identity out of it. And that's why we say, what does this mean about me? Is it, it pulls up those identity thoughts like I this, I that, and when those identity thoughts relax, um, I think it's easier than to come down into the pain and do a little bit more somatic work with it there. But again, it takes a while. I just ran through it quickly, mm -hmm. but it's a process often right. for people. So what about someone who says, okay, so I'll do that and my mind won't be so busy around it, but 
I have something wrong in my body. Yes. <laughs> what do we do with that? So it gets even more subtle because as the mind quiets, you can go into uh, literally with my spine pain, it has felt in the quietest moments like I'm like it's right here in front of me. And then, you, you know, here's what I say go to the doctor if you have to, number one, because mm-hmm. look, some pain is there to signal an issue that can only be solved with surgery or something. I mean, I don't want to, inquiry is not the answer to everything for sure. And I don't want people to bypass anything based on what I'm saying, go to the doctor if you need to, or whatever you need to take aspirin or whatever to get through a moment. But when you can, if you come down, there's all sorts of little subtle stories that we've picked up. Just the idea there's something wrong with me. Like there's something wrong with my body. Just being able to still go to the doctor. (laughs) I'm not saying inquire this Mm -hmm. away and, and avoid. I'm just saying for your own peace and well-being, when you're down in there, continue asking that question what does this mean about me because then it gets down to what we've learned from science like we've been told that this is your spine it's broken you have spinal stenosis you're always going to have spinal stenosis there's nothing you can do about it there's that paradigm there which although helpful thank you doctor creates the more stories around it and so I've had to work through the whole Western medicine story as I've gone down there because the Western medicine story tells me this is a physical problem and only you can only solve it through the doctor, which sometimes you can, obviously, Mm -hmm. and sometimes you can't. Um, But for me, knowing that I don't really have any routes in Western medicine, I don't take the medication except for gabapentin. I don't want that medication. That's the only reason that was useful to me. Their treatments didn't help. Their surgeries didn't help. And now they're telling me there's really not much they can do except for like a spinal cord stimulator. So I don't have that route. Like for people who have that route, that's great. You know, if you have, it could be cancer. I had cancer. Thank God I went to the doctor and didn't inquire that away. And that's why I say that. But right now I don't have any other than posture, exercise, movement. Inquiry has really been the most helpful thing. But yeah, getting down to the somatic piece, I'll just tell you that I've seen. Just the stories like this is your spine, your spine is broken, there's something wrong. Um, All the things we learn about our bodies are there, whether we learn them from the doctors or we learn them in school or whatever, and it's part of the programming. So I fished out all of that, you know, until it was just a quiet sensation, uncomfortable, but no thoughts on it. I would ask, what is this? Or, and it would be nothing, you know, maybe just a, the word spine, very light at the end would come up. It's, it's a spine. Okay, thanks for the information. <laughs> it's a spine. Okay, now that word is gone. And then that's where the real somatic work started when there was just nothing. I was in no thought land at that point. And then from there is when I worked with the resistance and it started to dissolve. And a lot of it then too is not just that it's dissolving, it's that the way that I'm relating to it is better. Like, you know, being with it restfully and that's challenging when you have a nerve pain in the middle of the back, you know. Mm-hmm. But it t- it took a while just to reor- reorient myself, so to speak, or reorient awareness to it, to be able just to be with it, even when it's bad, but also to inquire into it and rest with it and use mm-hmm. our tools with it. Yeah. <laughs> I think most people could probably relate to if I tighten up against something, it is more painful. You know, yes. if we're clenching our teeth, our teeth eventually hurt. You know, if yeah. our shoulders are up around our ears. Yes, yes. Hurt, right? Yeah. So that unlinking the thoughts that cause all of that tension has to help. It does. And I skipped over a whole set of things that I forgot about. Because frankly, as I was working with that, as you can imagine, some really early conditioning came up that was very surprising around mom and dad mm-hmm. and how they conditioned me a certain way. And frankly, some some anger, and uh, at moments hatred, frankly. And I knew to trust that. You know, I knew it was part of the process. I, would, I didn't like freak out, like, "Oh my god!" No, I thought this is good. I'm tapping into something. That was one thing that came up. And it's it, <laughs> the thing is, I had great parents, frankly. But yeah. it was just like when you're conditioned a certain way. And I'll just tell you this: is my parents did everything for me. Okay, they they took care of things for me. Now that's great when you're a kid, but when you're an adult, it doesn't work out so well, right? You have to 
learn how to do those things. So what came up was an anger towards them that was very deep. Um, I trusted that. I felt into it. There were moments, Lynn, where I was literally just, just like had this angry, just angry pose, almost like an animal who's angry. And I just went with it and I just felt right into it. I could feel the energy of the anger just moving through the belly and the spine. I sat with that for a few days. That was one thing that came up. Of, like, you could say it's a trauma, but it's an old memory or conditioning. It's painful. That must have helped too, because as I worked through that, it's like it, it softened that. You know, of course, I was like seeing that, well, there must be more there if mom and dad came up. And not a lot came up after that, though, in terms of stories or conditioning. And then I went back to somatically resting with it. Some people would have gone to, um, there's something the matter with me because I hate my parents or I'm not a good person because I'm angry with them. So you didn't have to deal with a lot of that. I didn't because I trust, like I said, I trusted what was coming up. And I, because we've done so much work here, all of us, and I've done so much work with people and myself, you know, when, when an emotion comes up, I'm like, yes, that's, that's great. It's not like awful. It's like, oh, it's like striking gold because that was already there. And now I can feel that and let it come up and, and not take ownership of it just let it be what it is mm -hmm. and i think sometimes people are scared of that because when they were a child it wasn't safe to feel that that's why it got stored in the body and so now as an adult to know that that's okay it's a good thing that that's coming forward that you can sit with it i mean you have to be in a safe space for sure you know, whether you're working with somebody else, I mean, it's a safe space here to do inquiry with my partner. He, like if he sees me in inquiry, he just leaves me alone. It's a safe space. Mm -hmm. And again, you're right. If people haven't done a lot of work like this, like we have, they might sort of, I don't want to say misinterpret, but, but not understand the process of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I, I just understood the process. So I welcomed the anger, knowing that it was temporary, it, you know. It's going to be temporary. It's not going to keep hold of me. And if I push it back down, that can't be good. So what other choice do you have? Right. You know, if I turn away from it and distract myself, I'm just pushing it back down. If I get ashamed of it, then somehow I'm pushing it back down. If I make a story out of it, it's about me that I shouldn't be feeling that. That's a way of pushing it back down. And when you're in pain, you don't want to push anything back down. <laughs> you, you want to work through that. You don't want to like stuff it back down. So for me, it was a no brainer. Just be with it. Yeah. Go with it. Right. If we bring in some of the understanding of the nervous system where we feel overwhelmed and pain must feel like a threat mm -hmm. and a life threat at times, yeah. I'm sure, the level of pain oh, yeah. that you were in and that people are. So when we're threatened, people usually go into a fight or flight response or into immobilization. Is that something that you were working with as well? Absolutely. I mean, the, the night that I stood literally right here, I live in an RV. I'm, I'm pointing at the floor below this table. I was standing right here. My partner was back there. And uh, I was in a freeze state because I couldn't function. I, could, I literally couldn't even reach for a cup or a bone. I was just in a freeze state. And I went, to, I think I went to the emergency room that night. And I still have the image of me in a wheelchair, just in enormous pain absolutely enormous pain and, and and it's like everybody's just doing something else not attending to me and yeah I, I think that was a I didn't uh, actually that night I left the the, the emergency room because I was like they're not going to be able to help me mm -hmm. and that was a flight I mean I was just I'm in a free state and then a flight state mm -hmm. and then of course when I got into the car again I just rested with it more and rested and looked at the thoughts and stuff and it calmed down luckily it didn't stay at that acute level but absolutely yeah there have been times when i've been in pain where anger came out because it's just like i'm i'm in pain and it just the anger comes out um but that's calmed down too that was in the early stages um but yeah i i feel for anybody lynn who's going through something like this more than i ever have before i have such compassion and i i just want to reach out to those people who don't have these tools and who are struggling with how to take care of their pain. I have such compassion for them. And I just want to reach through the camera and say, come talk to us. Like, mm. like let's, let's work together on this because I just can't imagine handling this without re presence and inquiry. I can't imagine what that would be like. I'm sure I would survive it in some way, but it's, it's a bit scary to think that people don't have these tools and, and they're just, they're 
I don't know what they do with it. It's like, you just, I'd like to know what they do with it, you know, other than medicate, medicate it, but right. you know, how do you live with that ongoing pain every day? Well, and I think if we look at COVID-19 and what people are doing to cope with that, that's probably an indication, you know, mm -hmm. some big things happen too. And same thing. I thought, I, how could I have gotten through this without knowing my mind, without meditation, without yeah. inquiry? It's yeah. really hard. Yeah. So people drink yeah. more or they eat or they binge watch Netflix or they do all of these things to just get a little break from it, but it doesn't really help. It doesn't. And you know, you can't be with it all the time in inquiry. You can't just be like in your body resting because you have to live and interact. And of course, there's times when I did the Netflix thing because I couldn't sit with it all the time, just watch Netflix, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. And that, I think about that too in COVID, not just with chronic pain, but with people out there don't have a support system. They're dealing with some sort of pain. We aren't talking about that today, emotional pain. But chronic pain, physical pain too. Certainly, if you don't have a lot of connections, you're all alone, and you're just reaching for anything I can imagine to distract mm -hmm. yourself. And there's even studies out there that say distraction is one of the best pain relievers. But of course, but you know, you can't you can't live your entire life in distraction. You know, I mean, it's very mm -hmm. exhausting. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason it's exhausting is that the energy it takes to suppress something. Yes. It does. And, you know, as soon as I start resting with it, it automatically is feels better because my I'm reorienting, reorienting to it in a way instead of distracting away from it, I'm just resting. And when you rest with it and you get really quiet, you start to see that it is just a sensation. You know, the mind is not involved and you're not trying to suppress anything. And I think it's, it's good. I still don't think people have the skills to do that. They don't have they don't know how to do that. A lot of people. And that's the thing that I, I wonder about, like all those people out there, they don't have that resource you know yeah well and i think one of the one of the things you talked about a little while ago too was shame that you don't have shame and that you put it out there this is what it's like and so i think that's really helpful and knowing about the nervous system it's an involuntary response our primitive brain is reacting to threat it shuts us down it puts mm -hmm. us into fight or flight and then people can can just take away some of the shame like there's something wrong with me Mm -hmm. And even, you know, with COVID, so many people are saying, well, I'm not very productive or I'm finding that I'm just kind of in freeze or, and that's just our nervous system. It's difficult to cope when we're overwhelmed. It is. You know, when we're overwhelmed, it's also challenging to go into inquiry when you get to high levels of pain. You know, when you get like eight, nine, 10 level nerve pain, the only thing I'm doing is headed to the hospital. <laughs> it's the only thing I'm doing. Now, when it gets down to six, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That's where I do most of the work because at that level 10, you're really in some sort of fight, flight, or freeze. If your nervous system is just naturally doing that. <laughs> in fact, when I sat on the couch here with enormous pain, uh, unbelievable pain, Lynn, if you would have seen me, um, resting with it is all that I did, believe it or not. I was in a blizzard, couldn't go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So here I am resting with this, what feels like a fire in my chest. Just a, uh, but in resting with this, even though I, I was moving around, trying, you know, I was still resting with it. I was still feeling the fire, just in the awareness. And then eventually it just, it just came down. But yeah, that's a fight. There was a fight, flight, freeze response, all three in that, I feel like. There was a, well, not so much a fight, but certainly a flight response and a freeze response that I had to deal with during that one. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so in your mind you're not making it worse by believing thoughts about it. Here's the thing, Lynn, and uh, you just said the other, you said a second ago, there's something wrong with me. And I want to say to people, okay, go to the doctor. That's my first thing. I'm not saying don't, or go to the, the natural path or whoever you're working with, but challenge that thought, you know, and one way to do that is just to sit quietly and say, there's nothing wrong with me. I've done that one many times. And the first thing that comes through is, yes, there is a very strong yes. And then some other thoughts. But if I just listen to the yes from awareness, just hear it come through with all of its momentum several times, and then it'll show me thoughts. It'll say, there's something wrong with your spine. It's broken. You got to do something. And then as those thoughts quiet, that's easier to deal with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge to deal with 
pain and painful thoughts. Right. It's a challenge. But can I just deal with pain without the painful thoughts? All right. That's easier. And then the painful thoughts also cause more contraction in your body, which then makes the pain worse. It does, because you can talk about it in terms of tension or resistance or stress. Science calls it, says stress exacerbates pain. Been researching that a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, what is stress from an intern from awareness? What is stress? It's it's of course the nervous system responding naturally the way that it does, but it's also stories like there's something wrong with me. Those right. create stress in the body, and you can feel it. You can feel that when your thoughts are going like that, you can feel that the pain will amp up because the fear and the stress and the resistance is amping up around it. But then when the thoughts relax, the, the stress of those thoughts relax, and you can feel it relaxing because the thoughts went away. But I'll even tell you this, is that when I went to discover the pain without thoughts, I saw it as tension or stress or resistance. I saw it almost like, this is not a great metaphor, but almost like a fist mm -hmm. is doing this. In different ways, though, it wasn't just a clear fist. It was like a writhing, sort of like yeah. this. And I could just, one thing is just going into each one of those little uh, movements with awareness and letting my awareness go with it, you know, because the stress is like trying to fight it, the stress of the mind, the stress of the body. But when you're in awareness and something is trying to contract, if you bring your attention into it and let it contract fully, it's almost like you're giving it so much permission that it doesn't know what to do. It, it has new information there. And it changes as a result of you allowing it so much. And so that's what I did with each of the little areas in the spine that are contracting is bringing attention into that so that it fully allows that. And then it just doesn't know what to do with that. It's the way I explain it. It's, just, it's like that's new information because it's been stressful and resistant there. Now there's acceptance and presence and it just moves and changes because it doesn't, know, <laughs> it doesn't really know how. To, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's modus operandi, so to speak, is to do this. That's mm -hmm. its information. When you rest and accept it, it doesn't. It gets new information, so to speak. Right. Mm. So, if we're transferring that strategy, if you can call it that, to emotional pain, so how would that relate to that? Same thing. So, with emotional pain, you know, as you know, there's like when we talk about emotions, we have to talk about whether these are emotions that are dispersed and throughout the body, like a wave of energy of sadness. That's different than that there's, as you know, emotion caught in a contraction or something, like in the stomach or the chest. So talking about the first one, where you're just in the middle of, whether you're in inquiry or just in life, and you feel sadness, yeah, again, the thoughts will create resistance to it in stories. Mm -hmm. If you can watch the thoughts or inquire into them and get to the actual sadness in just the same way, it's feeling into it, allowing it to move, like offering it no resistance so that it can just be there as a wave of energy, every time it passes, if it's a dispersed energy, almost every time in inquiry. Mm -hmm. Now, with contractions, as you know, because we deal with heart contractions and stomach, that's a little trickier because it's more like pain. Mm -hmm. It's more similar to pain in the sense that it's contracted energy and there's often emotion inside of it. So the same thing applies if there's a contraction of emotion in the chest. I'm always pointing people to feel into it and allow its movement whatever it's doing and we say dance with it you know mm. um it's a very nuanced tool but to dance with it is to offer no resistance or where there is resistance just to allow that and let that move and then over time as you're inquiring into it because there's often thoughts to it that can shift and release information or release emotion and when mm. it does it's a matter of again feeling that emotion not resisting or watching the resistance to it it's like to me striking gold though you know even though it's uncomfortable it's like oh this is coming up so yeah it applies i think to everything doesn't it it even applies to thoughts because if you notice when people are really identified with thoughts there's a there's a it's not always resistance but there's a oh how to, identification with it and, and and just being with the identification relating to it differently with thoughts welcoming the thought welcoming the resistance to it or welcoming the clinging to it is helpful it's 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 for everything really you know yeah. the way experience right. so somebody has been working all their life and now they're retiring and they get fibromyalgia or they have a back injury and it's like 
this is not fair. I deserve something different than what I got. How do you work with that? You know, first there has to be an openness, right? Because if someone is really anchored or hunkered down with those viewpoints, they might not even be open to questioning those thoughts and dealing with the pain. But if people are open, and a lot of times I think it's like anything, you have to suffer enough to become open to inquiry, you know, especially if you've already gone to Western medicine and they, they're not solving the problem, then you're, there's often a readiness at that point. But I, what I found through, through the years just recently is a lot of people, when they have the onset of pain, immediately the first thing they do is they go to the doctor looking for the answer. And I've had a couple of people do that. And so just let them do that because they may need, they may need surgery, may need something. But at some point, they become ready to look at their thoughts around it. And when they do, you know, I would just, I would invite them to look at some of those thoughts, those, the thoughts that are stressing them out about the situation first, start there, and then slowly move into the body and work with the resistance at, at that level. But it comes back, as you know, to readiness. Like you can't, you can't push this work on anyone, right? It just is something that you cannot proselytize. So they have to be ready because, you know, we are the best facilitators when we don't even have an agenda for other people. You know, as you know, we're mm -hmm. here, but we're not pressuring anyone um, to do this work. And that's what I think creates the open invitation because we're not, we're just saying this is here and we're, I'm sharing about it. I'm sharing about it right now. I don't have to go out and, and try to get people to do this. All I have to do is share my own experience and say, look, I've been through this, you know, I've, and this is how I dealt with it. And then people hear that, I think, and they say, okay, maybe um, maybe there's something here that I should look at. Mm -hmm. They start getting ready. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a possibility that it's not going to be like this forever, that maybe it could change or get better. Because I think we yeah. need role models, kind of, of people who, you know, someone who has a clear mind, who can witness things, who can be in their body. I think yes. that's encouraging for people. It is. And I hope to do some groups for chronic pain. Like again, a lot of compassion for people mm -hmm. of, of any people suffering, but really the ones with chronic pain, because I've been through it and I want to, I want to say, Hey, let's get together. Let's talk about this. There's, there are ways to deal with this. It don't involve swallowing a bunch of pills all the time or mm -hmm. distracting yourself or eating your refrigerator until it's gone or mm -hmm. watching Netflix for three days in a row. <laughs> There's other ways to deal with it. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to get out there now that I feel better. I didn't feel like doing that during all that time. But yeah. now that it, it's kind of changing and shifting and I can see, it's like with anything, when I can see the value of our work, sometimes only after I've gotten through something, because in the middle of it, you're just looking and looking and it's painful and you keep looking. And then you get on the other side of that and you realize all that looking was super helpful, actually. But in the time I was doing it, so now I know where to go. I have a little map. Uh, that I've worked out for myself and I can help other people and I want to because I feel better. Right. I'm really, really excited about that actually. So what's coming up for the future for you, do you think? Um, now that I feel better, <laughs> it's all about that, right? I always say, I mean, you got to have your health. I mean, your health needs right. it away. Um, I feel like this, the future is, is, is wide open for me. Um, the world is changing. I don't know if this is a long-term change or we're just dealing with 2020. But I think that the work that we do, you and I, it has a lot of value in the world as it changes. COVID may go away through the vaccine at some point, but we certainly still have a lot of issues to deal with, like mm -hmm. climate change, um, civil unrest. Um, there's just tons of issue. Healthcare, chronic pain, depression, addiction. It's all out there. And when COVID goes away, that, those things are not necessarily going to go away because uh, they were there before. So I see this work as when we get the word out is helping more people. It's just we've got we've we've now 50, almost 15 years of experience with working with people with these inquiries, and that feels really good to have under our belt to go out and share this work with people. So I feel like the sky's the limit. We're building the Killaby inquiries, as you know. We're trying to get that going. You're doing wonderful work on your own, uh, helping people every day. That's what I plan to do: is find different ways to help, just to reach out and say, hey, there's another way. Right, yeah. Right? Exactly, yeah. So one of the things that we know a lot about is how the mind works and how the nervous system works. And from awareness, maybe you could touch into that a little bit. 
when you say from awareness or with awareness, what's how is that different? You're talking about witnessing thoughts, mm-hmm. being present in the body somatically. That's right. Somebody, how does somebody get to that if they're not already really familiar with that? You know, I think a lot of people come to this work because they get interested in meditation first. Mm-hmm. That's one way. It's like a doorway into this. And so meditators often start to find a peace and a freedom and they become more interested in that and they find their way to what we do inquiry. Um, If they don't have that background and they're really new to this work, sometimes we have to set a lot of context. So I'll send them to the Keo videos or something and just let them sit with that for a while. But if I'm working with them, I'll just point like you do. I'll point to the fact that we can witness everything with our eyes closed without all the the lights and the colors and the shapes to distract they can get a sense like if i point to my own experience they can verify it so if i say pull up a picture of dad can you see that and just know that you are what's looking at that you can't find your the the awareness but you are looking at that and so just getting them situated or aware that they are aware <laughs> that's it first okay. yeah yeah. Uh, and then also not just aware of thoughts, but as you say, they can hear sound from awareness immediately. They can feel sensations right here. So they can never find awareness, but awareness is always there experiencing something, just pointing to it and then inviting them throughout the day to come back and recognize that. You know, if they're interested, just mm-hmm. come back. You don't have to go for an hour sitting in meditation. You can. It's great if you do. But throughout the day, coming back to that, if you can, whenever you remember. That's the best way that I've found through the years. There's different pointers, obviously, to that um, that I use, but that's what I tell people. You know, one of the things that I was so struck by when I first got involved, it must be 10 years ago now I've known you, and that you said thoughts are words and pictures. We hear words or we can see them in our mind's eye, like they're written on something. And then pictures are like little video clips or still pictures. And I've yeah. been meditating for so long at that point, but I never, I never <laughs> realized that. And so it's been so much more specific. Yeah. Like, I can look at this image, like you yeah. see a picture of dad, and then I can put it in a frame. I can yeah. type on it. I can do all these tools that we have. Yeah. The inquiries. And people always go, oh, wow, what happened to that picture? It just got really faded. <laughs> And it doesn't mean anything, mm-hmm. and then the then we can go into the body and and things. You know, we have a response to the images and words in our mind. Yeah, our body responds, and then that's how they're linked, right? And that's something uh, that's a level of detail that I think is so helpful. It is, and you know, it, we're getting even more skillful with it because you know when you what I notice is when I'm working with people who are new to this, they'll have thoughts or they'll have an image come up dad or something and i already know that there's some stories connected to it some words connected because words and pictures often Mm -hmm. so i'm getting to a place where it's like i can mine out the words from every picture because it's not just a picture there's a meaning there in the story Mm -hmm. and so they're amazed to see oh when i pull out the words and i just see them and then they fall away the picture changes um it gets lighter or something so that's another way we 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 like as you said years ago started talking about words and pictures but then now we're really seeing how those things are linked up just this morning i had a session where a lady was going through words and she didn't even recognize there was a picture of her dad there she just thought and then i said okay now turn to the picture of dad she's like i would never have really looked at that directly and it was a really scary picture because Mm -hmm. of what happened and then but she was able just to sit with it she sat with it for a long time words came out of it and then it fell away and she was so relieved to see something in her mind that she did not know like a little splinter of a thought and it just took her to look at it and and, and somebody to direct her to look at it and it was it'd been there for years you know that it's, it's yeah. just years for it been there but yeah and it drives so much catastrophic thinking and tension and pain and suffering. <laughs> yeah yeah speaking of radical recovery yeah yeah yeah, yeah it drives a lot of that a lot of it is linked i mean so many times when I've gone into work with somebody on drinking or gambling or something, inevitably it comes back to images of childhood, what mom thought of me, what dad did or didn't do. It's all linked up in some way. In inquiry, we can find those links. We can see them. 
and we don't and the great thing is we don't have to analyze because god knows i tried that for years as an attorney analyzing everything yeah. and it didn't get me anywhere other than a good and analytical mind um yeah. it didn't free me of the suffering so with witnessing it's gentler you're not trying to change anything letting things be letting things be seen and that's it right so let's talk about shame just for a minute here before we finish so people have all kinds of stories about themselves and based on experiences often like say what did mom dad think of me what happened at school i know you were bullied pretty seriously as a as a child so we we come with all of these um shame responses and then we that's part of what makes it so we can't really be present within so how do you get from that to compassion and kindness for yourself and i know partly it's just a kind of a falling away but what would you say about that i would say it's a falling away for sure but what i notice about my own shame is that i had to bring it up in a safe space first because what i found with the shame is that it just there were just layers and layers of unseen things and unfelt energies i think a lot of people when i start talking about shame they'll say yeah i felt that and they'll say things like it's very deep they're pointing to the the unconsciousness of it. So when we developed KI, as you know, we've developed ways to pull up some of those unconscious things. So shame itself, it's like, yeah, it's a feeling that may come up every now and then. But to go into inquiry about it, there's lots of words and pictures that go with that. And so we developed inquiries, as you know, that would pull them up. And that's where I think it is. is yeah, you, you want to be with it. But when shame is driving your life to a certain degree, it does help to be a little bit more proactive around that to get into those deeper layers. Otherwise, it continues to run the show, especially around addictions, but around a lot of things. So just being making sure that people feel safe. That's always an issue with our work. Make sure they're safe um, to, to feel in and look at different things. But then to pull to use some inquiries when, they're, when they feel safe enough to pull some of those layers up that they can't see. And there's inquiries that we have that will do that, as you know. And then, again, letting them witness that, come and feel that, and then rest. And then being in presence and feeling, okay, and then are you ready to go deeper? Do you want to go deeper or do you want to stop? And then those keep going. And shame is one of those things, I think, that most people that have a lot of it have to spend some time with. Right. Um, it's not going to be like in one setting, you're going to probably uproot or see through, or, you know, you have to be with that for a while and just rest mm -hmm. with it and see it. But if you're in the work, it's not a problem. It's going to be natural for you to just want to go to that at some point. Mm -hmm. And just keep asking that question. What does that mean about me? Yeah. So we've had experiences of being shamed, sometimes yeah. public shaming as well. Yes. And, and what does that mean about me? And all of those experiences are stored somewhere mm -hmm. so we can be with them with awareness. Now that you mentioned that, in May, uh, shame came up, but not around having pain, but it came up around sex, uh, being gay, sexual expression. And it was probably connected to the spine um, in some way, but it, I just remember that leaving like that that whole thing just left me but it was really powerful and strong when it came up it was a very strong feeling of being i have to hide that was the feeling i have to hide this is an old story and just watch through that so that definitely came up um yeah so i don't even think frankly lynn that i really became skillful at looking thoroughly at shame until about five six years ago I don't think I knew how to deal with it until we started to develop some of these. I just couldn't get to those layers like I can now or have been able to now. Yeah. It hides from us. It hides from us, yeah. Can you just kind of walk us through the reverse inquiry and the utility inquiry, how that might work with shame? Yeah. Okay. So what I often say is reverse inquiry is it's like, one way is to say is like they say there's worms in the earth you can't see them so you have to hold food over them before they're going to come out if you don't put the food there they're not going to come out you're not going to see them right so reverse inquiry is like the food and you go to what you believe so one simple soft reverse inquiry is that the belief is that i'm ashamed it's a very it's a, it's a surface layer thought just reverse that quietly and say i don't feel ashamed and then your mind will produce, the worms will come out of the earth. Mm. And you'll see, yeah, I do. And I'll show you pictures and words of that 
verify or prove that. And then you just rest and see those and let those just be there one at a time or as a collage, quietly watching. You might do some tapping to shift focus there if you need to. But as that falls away, just know that's kind of just the surface layer, rest there for a second. And then what I say is turn up the heat a little bit if you feel safe, you know, because that first inquiry is only gonna give you so much when you reverse it. Mm -hmm. But what I did for myself and I do for other people is I, I turned up the heat and eventually got to an inquiry that said, I'll, I'll expose myself to everyone everywhere all the time. That was a lot of resistance to that one. I could feel my whole body saying no to that, to avoid the shame. And, but I worked through that layer. So that's another one. It's, it's, it's a reverse inquiry because the belief is I'm not going to tell anybody anything any, anytime okay. because yeah. that's what shame does. That's what shame is. So to reverse it, I'm going to tell everybody, I'm going to reveal myself completely to everybody everywhere all the time is so far the sharpest inquiry that I've had around shame. And that's what brings up the deep layers of it and the thoughts of like, no, screaming no mm -hmm. to protect myself. And then the feeling of that shame. I've also worked with shame with people who have porn addictions. I'll say, imagine yourself in front of the computer, whatever you're doing, and everybody can see you. Mm -hmm. And it's it, only when they're ready for something like that would I ever right. put someone on that. But they get to that place where there's like, they're clear. It's like they feel like there's still something there and they want to go a little bit further. So I'll say, just imagine yourself there. Now everybody sees you. And then that brings up some of the, the so just reverse inquiries, reversing beliefs. But also, it's all in the way that you word the inquiry. Yeah. It's yeah. how you word it. And what I found is more specific is always better. You know, so if I say I'm not ashamed, that's very general. This right. doesn't, right? But if I say I'm not ashamed about um, my drinking. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's different because that pulls up mom and the people that might be involved in that. Or um, again, saying I can expose myself to everyone everywhere all the time is very specific. <laughs> okay. It's not general yeah. and it brings up more. Well, and if you imagined you're in the kind of coming to the end of a drunk fest, really loaded, and you're blah. And imagine having that on a big screen somewhere or having, you know, people that you love watch you at the end of a eating binge or yeah, anything like that. Eating binge or anything like that. Yeah. You know, yes. Did you have a question in that? Or yeah. Oh, just a comment that, that when you said that, I thought, yeah, I can imagine the shame. And we don't have to really imagine it either because we've all seen that look on people's faces before. Yeah. <laughs> Judgments. So like. yeah. 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 Well, often I'll do people, I'll work with people, what I call aftermath inquiries. Like they'll come to me and say, well, I, I was on the computer for eight hours last night watching this, or I went and binge and ate like all kinds of bad food yesterday. And now I'm having a session. So now we're dealing with the aftermath, which is the deficiency stories. There's something wrong with me. I'm awful. I can't believe I did it. I'm bad. I'm wrong. And then the shame, we work with the shame, I'm ashamed of this, and I don't want anybody to know working with that. And actually helps people in the aftermath because otherwise they, I think that the aftermath is part of the preoccupation with addiction. We talk about preoccupation. And I don't think science has gotten really very deep into that subject, but I think that we can because we now know that the preoccupation, like before you use or before you binge, is not just the preoccupation to use, but also a preoccupation to not like judging the thing. Both mm -hmm. sides of that coin create a preoccupation in the mind. And then there's the using, and then there's the aftermath, which plays into the preoccupation because the deficiency stories come up like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I'm bad. I'm wrong. Preoccupation in the mind mm -hmm. with that, with that. So what we work with a lot, as you know, is preoccupation. Science even says it's, it's, it's one of the main characteristics of addiction. When the preoccupation around before doing something and after it quiets down, I think the compulsivity towards that thing comes mm -hmm. down, can come down. Mm -hmm. But again, it takes, there's no magic pill. It's not like I'm going to say one thing and then all that's going to fall away. Right. We have to look at it. A revealing kind of a process. And then to see the usefulness of, of hiding, 
when you've been shamed for being outed or whatever it might oh, be. Yeah. There's a utility there that we don't maybe need it anymore, but maybe we still do. There is. And you, you mentioned utility and I didn't say, but utility would be a simple utility would be, let's imagine that you just went on a food binge and um, you're feeling shame after. Mm -hmm. So utility is what's the payoff of the shame. So if I say, what is, what do I get out of feeling ashamed after I did that? And that's where it comes up. Well, well I have to hide something like that. Or um, what's the utility What's the utility of being ashamed afterwards if you sit quietly? What's the what's the payoff? Being ashamed. Ah, yeah, what comes up is it doesn't feel relevant to me right now, but what comes up is I have to hide. I mean that that that's a resource or a utility. And what I tell people is, yes, there's you do have to hide in, <laughs> in certain situations, you unless you want to be judged and shamed, because of the because of the consciousness of the other individual. Right. For example, if the other individual is very angry or anxious or shaming or judging. Naturally, you're not going to want to traumatize yourself by just revealing everything. Yeah. So it's okay. But then as you get more and more comfortable standing in your own power and your own presence, and you don't care as much what other people think, then you can come out and, 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 and let people know, and only then, when you don't need that utility of hiding. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important to be um, realistic about where we're at. And yes. Be strategic as well. Like you don't, you don't want to bare your throat so somebody can go for it. Yeah. If you know that they're not a safe person for you to do that with. You're right, and we talk about this. There's boundaries that have to be set. Yeah. That these are boundaries. You know, it's like mm -hmm. I'm clear in my own self. I feel okay, or I'm working through my stuff. But I have to set a boundary with you <laughs> because mm -hmm. this is not this is not a safe exchange of information. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's okay. I think boundaries are fine as long as they're they're clearly set and they're not coming naturally from just some sort of trigger. When there's a clarity around them, um, I think they're fine. They're part of life. Mm -hmm. And yeah. working with shame can be so freeing because we can look at that and go, okay, like when you were talking about being in a freeze response or a fight response to the level of physical pain and nerve pain, that's just your body responding to things going on it's not a failure in you it's your mammal body under threat mm -hmm. that can really help the shame to know that that's just how our system works this is how our system works we can apply that to many things too and not to give a permission to to be addicted but this is how our body works when we're addicted and, and to let go of some of the the stigma of that and then working with the addiction obviously being open to working with it not yeah. just saying okay i'm addicted yeah. But also just knowing this is your natural response is how you survive, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think it helps people. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about where people can get a hold of you. So it's killaby.com is your main portal. A wonderful series of all of the work over these years and starting with thought and going through the body and somatic and, and getting into a lot of detail. Yeah. Uh, you know, talking about trauma in the body. And, and so I highly recommend that people watch that. I know a lot about the work, of course, and I still really enjoyed watching it and learned things from it. So good. I think yeah, I, I think the motivation for that was like, I don't want to keep I want to I want to train facilitators. I want facilitators to be trained so they can obviously go out and help people. But as you know, what we want this work to do is to is for people to take it and, and let and be empowered with it is what I feel is to be empowered and not to feel like they have they have to continue to come back and that you may for a while need somebody. But if you could watch those videos and pick them up yourself, I think it empowers people. And how I felt about it is like, why wouldn't I share this? Why wouldn't I? Yeah. You know, I, I like I'm going to be gone someday. I don't know when that's going to be, but why am I holding back to share these tools? I, there's no reason. So I just went out and shared them. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of them. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so if people want to get a hold of you. If you go to killaby.com, there's a contact page. There's a contact thing. You can, and that's the best way. Um, I wouldn't say email me because it's a little bit clunky when you email me. It's better to go through the system. If you want to sign up for sessions, it's all there on that killaby.com. It's the best way to sign up for sessions if you're interested in facilitator training. Again, we want to train people because that they can go out and help people. If you're in the place where you're a coach or you're, you've had some clarity and you want to help other people, there's, that's all on that page. You can get information about that too. Okay. 
and um, then your YouTube channel, Facebook, all of those regular social media outlets as well. Facebook, I have Scott Kilby public page. You can just like it. I post uh, events and things and little quotes. And then, yeah, Scott Kilby YouTube um, oh. has quite a bit of, <laughs> it's funny, I look back at the old videos and I've all got different shapes and sizes through the years, but it's all Scott Kilby through the years, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so also, let's just kind of touch into your books, too. You know, the book that's getting the most feedback is Living a Realization, A Plain English Guide to Non-Duality. It has great reviews on Amazon, and people keep coming back to me saying, that was the book that helped them the most. Then again, there's Reflections of the One Life. It has daily pointers to awareness, one for every day throughout the year. It's called Reflections of the One Life. I know someone who's read that Reflections for the One Life every day for five years yes she, every time she comes back to it it's new you know yeah it's amazing okay. yeah it's, an, it's yeah. amazing to plant those seeds out there and then i yeah. kind of put the books out there and, and they're just out there and i don't really pay attention to it. and then people come back and say oh that helped me so much i'm like thank you i didn't know and of course when you write books like this a lot of times it just comes out of you you're not mm -hmm. you know it just comes out of you. you write it all down it's like a song that you write and you've, you've written that song and someone comes oh i love that song well great i'm glad it helped <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for sharing your experience and for giving people hope that things can actually change when, especially with that kind of pain that you're talking about. Yeah. Pretty easy to get despondent and feel like it's always going to be here. Yeah. So see you doing so well, too. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be doing well. And thank you again. I always say this thank you for the service that you've given through the years to Radical Recovery Summit. I feel like Radical Recovery Summit, we have somewhat of an audience but it's going to be out there for a long time it's going to be the set of video and it's going to be so rich for people for years to come if we can make it available so much good information you've done a great job thank well, you yeah and this year like every year i just love the group of people that we've gathered together and so diverse and different approaches and you know some of them are scientists like this year we're interviewing stephen forges uh with polyvagal theory and, you know, Slada Simone, who's got sassy spirituality, and he brings us a different mm -hmm. kind of life and energy. And it's yes. just interesting to talk with people who are so passionate about what we do. And uh, you're certainly one of them. Yeah, and that's, I, I just think that what you're doing and what we're doing is really on the cutting edge. We're bringing together all these, these voices that aren't being heard at a, yeah. at a time where people are, are often looking for something different. And nothing has quite formed fully. You know, there are things that are forming out there, but you're pulling those things together. And that's really a rich, uh, a rich environment. Yeah. 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 It's fun to do. Yeah. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Lynn. Take care. Welcome to the 2021 Radical Recovery Summit presented by the Killaby Center for Recovery. This is Lynn Fraser, your moderator. This year, our theme is Feel It, Heal It a new paradigm of recovery, featuring a diverse group of thought leaders and innovators, people who are working on the ground in the new field of addiction recovery. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to sign up and watch free.